It is terrific to be here today with my colleagues who, along with many of our colleagues that are not here today, uh, worked very hard over the last several years trying to make a difference for the women and men that serve in our military who have been victimized by sexual assault. Uh, at the beginning of all these reforms, there was a lot of discussion about what we wanted to accomplish. And there were three major goals. The first goal was to bring down the prevalence of sexual assault in the military. The second goal was to make survivors more comfortable about coming forward and increasing the numbers of reports that were made about sexual assault in the military in light of the fact that sexual assault is the most underreported crime in America, no matter where it occurs. And the third is providing a support system and services to victims and survivors that would give them a level, level of satisfaction about whether or not the system is responsive to them and listening to them and giving them a chance to recover. A year ago, after we passed a laundry list of long historic reforms in the National Defense Authorization Bill, the President asked the military to do a report over the next year and give it to him to actually assess the progress of the Department of Defense and all of the parts of the Department of Defense as to this problem. And today that report was released. Now let's go through our list. The first, prevalence. Prevalence is down 27 percent. Um, I think the, the Secretary of Defense said 25 percent, so I'm going to go with his number. I think it's technically closer to 27 percent. But 25 percent prevalence is down in our military uh, in terms of unwanted sexual contact. And this is year to year, apples to apples comparison with the surveys that have been done dating back um, uh, every two years for, for uh, some significant period of time. Reporting. Reporting of these crimes to the military has gone up 50 percent last year and another 8 percent this year. So we've had a combined total of 58 percent, and that's 8 percent over the 50 percent. So we have seen a spike that is continuing to climb in terms of reporting. Two years ago, only one in ten victims reported what happened to them in the military. Last year, it was one in four. Well, this, this, the year we're still in, but in 2014, it was one in four. A remarkable change in terms of victims being willing uh, to talk to people in the military about what has occurred to them. There has been a 62 percent increase in the number of unrestricted reports being made since 2012. Why is that important? It is one thing to come forward and make a restricted report in order to get services. It's another thing to make an unrestricted report where that information becomes known in the military and the perpetrator can be held accountable. And this is a really important one. The percentage of restricted reports being converted to unrestricted reports at the request of the victim continues to go up. It went up 14 percent last year and it went up 19 percent this year. And then finally, survivor satisfaction. And they did um, a thorough job. Not only did they have 57 different focus groups on 10 different installations involving 650 different survivors of sexual assault over the past year, they also did an anonymous survey of um, those who had been victimized by sexual assault in the military. And this was about the survivor experience. More than two-thirds in the survivor experience survey agreed that the unit commander supported them. Eighty-two percent of the survivors said the unit commander supported them, took steps to address their privacy and confidentiality, eighty percent, treated them professionally, seventy-nine percent, listened to them without judgment, seventy-eight percent, and thoroughly answered their questions, seventy percent. Seventy-three percent of the survivors indicated they were satisfied with the unit commander's response to the sexual assault. And 73 percent of the survivors also indicated that based on their overall experience, they would recommend others report what had happened to them to the military. Ninety percent indicated they were satisfied with the services provided by the Special Victims Council, one of the most um, important reforms that we accomplished a year ago, whereas only three percent indicated they were dissatisfied. A large majority of the survivors 
Between 84 and 89 percent were satisfied with the services they received from their SARC, which is their unit that deals with sexual assault response, and would likely recommend other survivors meet with these individuals after experiencing a sexual assault. The focus groups. The participants felt overwhelmingly that they had been trained adequately on sexual assault resources and policies. Most of them knew how to contact. Uh, their SARC and the other people responsible to assist them at times of, of crisis and would trust them to handle report. And they also indicated overwhelmingly that they recognized a positive shift in the Department of Defense's handling of sexual assault as well as leadership encouraging an environment of dignity and respect. Um, those are the top lines. Um, now, there is not all good news in this report. First of all, we still have too many sexual assaults. Secondly, we've got to do more on retaliation. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues now, and I'm happy to address, if none of them address retaliation, I'm happy to address it in questions at the end. Uh, retaliation has not gone up, but it's flat. And I would just mention briefly that the majority of the retaliation is peer-to-peer -peer social retaliation. Um, and even that administrative retaliation that's cited, if you get into the details of these reports, you realize it's not the commander that has responsibility for determining whether charges are filed, but rather the lower level commanders uh, in the units that have been responsible for some of the administrative retaliation. Um, so nothing in the uh, alternate proposal would change anything in regard to the retaliation that's been reported uh, in the surveys today. So, and let me turn it now over to my friend and colleague, um, Kelly Ayotte, who um, all of us worked very closely on this and, and give her a chance to address uh, uh, the mostly good news we've had today. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Senator McCaskill and obviously the report uh, pr produced and released by the Pentagon today is very, very important. If you look at the 12 metrics on nine out of the 12 metrics in this report, there is clear, clear evidence of progress. And to put it very simply, um, the fact that we have uh, prevalence down and reporting up uh, that is so critical as we look at these types of crimes where often, too often, they've been in the shadows. And this is something where we know if their prevalence is down and the reporting is up, that we are making progress going forward. Uh, I wanted to address, um, as we worked on this issue from the beginning, uh, all of us who are here today, uh, Senator McCaskill, Senator Levin, Senator Fisher, we understood from the beginning uh, that the reforms that were put in place, including, by the way, in the 2014 defense authorization, uh, we put in a provision to make retaliation a crime under the UCMJ uh, last year, uh, that we were going to have to continue uh, to not only measure the progress of uh, the department, but to ensure that the reforms that we have passed are fully being implemented and that the members of the service understand and are being educated on not only what support services are out there like the Special Victims Council, which is clearly making a difference, uh, but also the fact that even on a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, you have to understand that retaliation is something that is a crime under the UCMJ now. Uh, so I think there is more to be done on retaliation. And we plan, uh, I know, going forward to ensure that not only the provisions that we put in place in the 2014 NDAA, but also in the NDAA, the 2015 NDAA, uh, which we hope may come to the floor in the next week, there's also a provision offered, uh, authored by Senator McCaskill and Senator Fisher and I that would allow those who have been separated from service, uh, who have been victims, <coughs> of a sexual assault to actually reopen that separation. So if you feel you've been retaliated against in some way, um, this provision will give those who feel that they've been treated unfairly an opportunity to uh, relitigate those issues in light of the fact that they've been victims of sexual assault to take into account sometimes the hesitancy and understandable feelings um, that victims have. And if they previously, even before we have passed these reforms, have been retaliated against, they will have the opportunity to come forward. And so I think that's an important provision in the 2015 NDAA, which uh, we've put together. Uh, 
if you look at over the last two years the progress that has been made it's very very important um, and to see this progress and we will continue to ensure that we do everything that we can uh, we're certainly not going to arrest arrest on some of the good news that we've seen today uh, we're going to continue to be vigilant and ensure uh, that we can not only reduce the number of sexual assaults we'd like to eliminate them in our military but that every victim understands uh, that they will be supported and be respected when they come forward and I think we see very positive trends today in this report and I think one of the most that Senator McCaskill already highlighted is that the vast majority of survivors express satisfaction with their sexual assault response coordinators, victim advocates, and special victim counsel. Uh, the fact that victims feel uh, when they are asked how was the system in terms of the people that are responding to support them and how were they treated uh, have expressed satisfaction. We want every victim to feel that way, but we've made tremendous progress. I want to thank my colleagues on this important issue. Uh, passing the NDA in 2015 will further help us deal with retaliation, and we're going to continue to hold uh, the leadership, uh, not only in the Pentagon, but in each of the service branches, accountable and responsible for continuing to implement the reforms we've passed and will continue to pass in the 2015 NDAA and ensure that victims of sexual assault and survivors are treated with the dignity and respect that they should be. Uh, with that, it's my honor to introduce the Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, who we are going to very much miss in, in the United States Senate for his leadership, Carl Levin. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Senator McCaskill, Senator Ayotte, all of the members of our committee that have uh, worked so hard in this uh, area. The report that the Department of Defense released today uh, provides some hard evidence that uh, we're making progress to end the scourge of unwanted sexual contact uh, in the military and that the steps that uh, we have taken in Congress and within the military uh, are having an effect. It's uh, surely welcome news that uh, service members report fewer instances of unwanted sexual contact. Um, it's also very important uh, that uh, more victims uh, are willing to come forward and report the sexual contacts that are unwanted that have existed. So you have a reduction in the actual number of sexual contacts. You have an increase in the willingness and the numbers of reports of the reduced number of sexual contacts. Uh, and also um, we have found or they found in this report that uh, information that uh, is not available or hasn't been available to law enforcement is going to be more and more available to law enforcement because of the unrestricted uh, nature of the report and the growing number of unrestricted reports. The last three defense authorization acts have contained more than 50 provisions to fight sexual assault. We've held commanders accountable to create a command climate in which victims believe that they can come forward to report an assault. In our bills over the last couple years, uh, we have required commanders who are aware of an assault allegation to immediately report that to law enforcement. We have provided victims of assault by another service member with a special victims council, and that is one of the most major reforms that we have put in place. That's a lawyer who works for them and not for the commanders or for the court. We have removed the commander's authority to overturn sexual assault convictions. We've required that every decision by a commander not to prosecute an assault allegation be reviewed by a higher authority, and that if the decision not to prosecute contradicts advice from a commander's legal advisor, that the review be performed by the service secretary himself or herself. The bill that we hope to pass next week includes another 20 provisions aimed at sexual assaults, including eliminating the good soldier defense, giving victims a voice in whether their case is prosecuted in military or civilian courts, giving victims the right to challenge court martial rulings that violate their rights and to challenge those rulings at the Court of Criminal Appeals, to strengthen the psychotherapist-patient privilege. 
We just simply, though, cannot stop until we've totally halted this plague. We've made progress, but so long as there is one sexual assault and one unwanted sexual contact in the military, the call to action remains strong and I know is going to be carried on by my colleagues in the Armed Services Committee. Well, flip a coin here. And Senator Fisher's next. Thank you all very much. Um, I want to recognize my colleagues who are up here, Senator Ayotte, our Chairman Carl Levin, Senator Graham, but especially Senator McCaskill. She has truly been a leader on this issue. She has the experience. She has the knowledge. And she had the leadership to, uh, to put ideas forward, to gather information, to, to bring in ideas from all of us on how we can make progress on this issue. You've heard the Chairman and Senator McCaskill and Senator Ayotte outline steps that we've taken in previous NDAA bills. You've heard the Chairman highlight uh, what we hope to pass next week in the NDAA that comes forward uh, before the Senate. And we will continue to make progress. This is the way we need to go, and I believe that this report that came out today highlighted that. One area that I think we need to focus on is the retaliation piece. And I know that with uh, the leadership with Senator McCaskill and Senator Ayotte and Senator Graham uh, and myself, we will continue to work on that as well. Again, the report uh, had good news. It, had, it, it showed some progress, but it also showed a need where we need to continue to focus and continue to step forward. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on that piece and more, as they have said, to make sure that we eliminate this issue, this, this scourge that is facing our military members. So with that, I would like to introduce Senator Graham. Thank you. Uh, about Carl Levin, I, I, I cannot tell you how responsible he's been as chairman of the Armed Services Committee dealing with a lot of delicate issues from detainees to sexual assault to make sure that the system gets better, but we always strike a balance. And uh, Carl will be missed. Uh, I just can't say enough about his leadership. Uh, as to these three ladies here, uh, at the end of the day, it's been tough. I know it's had to be tough for them to be talking about sexual assault and trying to strike a balance, uh, understanding the military's uh, need to improve, but also that the commander is an important part of the military. I respect you all. It's just been tough politics, but the report tells me that the military is listening and is beginning to get it. And here's what I don't want ever to happen. I've been a military lawyer for 32 years. This would be devastating, the fixing this problem. For one day, a commander be told by the first sergeant, sir, ma'am, last night there was an assault in the barracks. And the commander say, well, that's no longer my problem. Send it over to the lawyer. That's a devastating outcome in the military. It is that commander's problem. No problem in the military will be fixed in a sustainable fashion without commander by it. And if you believe, as I do, the military is not a perfect place, but it's the finest military on the planet today, you have to understand why. Commanders are held accountable and given the authority to do what they need to do to protect this nation. And part of that authority is to discipline the force. That has to be part of our military tradition for us to be successful. To our commanders, you're on the right track, but you're not there yet. To the unit members who are now being more supportive to an assault victim, you're doing the right thing for the unit, for the country as a whole. For those who want to retaliate, you do set your own peril. As to disposition, reporting is one thing and having the case conclude is another. Here's what I think is the most important reform on the disposition side. When the military lawyer tells the commander, sir, ma'am, we have a good case, and the commander says, I don't think so, that decision will be reviewed by the secretary of the service in question. From a commander's point of view, 
I can't think of a better signal to send of how seriously you better take this matter. And when the JAG and the commander say, we don't have a case, that decision goes up to the next level of command. Those two things in the military are tremendous checks and balances. We're not there yet. As Carl said, one assault, one harassment is one too many. But I dare say that when this is all over, if we continue to do what we're doing, having the oversight and pushing the system, that the military will be the most victim-friendly system in America. The military will be the system of all other systems in America where the leaders are going to be held accountable for what happens to the to people under their charge. The military is on the right track. The military will never get there unless the commanders continue to push. And I dare say they will, because the consequences of not taking this seriously will end your career. Question? Senator McCaskill? Yes. Um, on your point on tier to tier on retaliation, isn't, doesn't that speak a lot also to sort of the culture under a command? And isn't it ultimately then a command question and command problem at that point? And do you agree also with, uh, with Senator uh, Gillibrand's um, point that this was on record, or on, uh, uh, on that point, that it was a, uh, a screaming red flag in his report? Well, um, first of all, I think it's important to look not just at the retaliation, but dig into what these the surveys and the focus groups said about retaliation. The majority of it is peer-to-peer, -peer, and uh, that that is not peer-to-peer -peer is not at the highest level of command. And importantly, in the same survey, 73 percent of the victims said they would encourage others to report. And uh, 82 percent said they had confidence in the way the commanders were treating them. So um, we've got an issue with retaliation. Now, I asked when I was given the brief on this, when will we know how many retaliation cases have been filed? Because it's a crime now. It's prosecutable under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. We will get that information in April. There is follow-up work being done by the RAND Corporation, and we'll get a better look at whether or not uh, the investigators and whether or not the command climate is, in fact, going after acts of retaliation. I would be much more concerned about flat retaliation if we were getting numbers back saying, I don't have confidence in the command, the climate has not changed, we're not getting the support, and I wouldn't recommend other people coming forward. But we got just the opposite numbers, high levels of satisfaction with command climate high levels of satisfaction with their special victims councils and their victim advocates. And I think 73 percent of them saying they would recommend that others report is a very important number. Uh, if you are undergoing retaliation that is debilitating, the last thing in the world you're going to do is recommend somebody else come forward. So yes, we have a problem, and yes, we have to work on it. But if you just extract that figure out of this report and try to characterize this report as negative, that's a tortured analysis of this report. I think it, they're great. Mm -hmm. um, I was told. Um, I wasn't briefed on the details. And I'll be honest with you, he was announcing them as I was going to vote, and so I haven't yet had an opportunity to look at the details. I was just given a cursory top line. But the fact that he announced two different initiatives to get after the retaliation problem. And by the way, in the focus groups, let me read you a couple of quotes from the focus groups. So I think they are taking steps to handle that, because it's not something that anybody would tolerate, because now it's a violation of an article. Another uh, victim. It's already been addressed under the UCMJ. Now, if the commander retaliates because of that, he's facing UCMJ actions against him for the action he pulled. And the reason I pull those quotes out is because it's telling you that, th that they're learning. Uh, survivors are learning about the tools that are out there. They're learning about the support they have and that they can get. And they're learning that, in fact, this treatment is a crime and they can report it as such. So I do think. Um, I, I'm going to be very impatient about progress on this, and I'll look forward to seeing how many cases have been filed in April. I, uh, all of us 
listen, there's nobody who worked on this that doesn't have the same goal. We want to protect victims, we want to hold commanders accountable, and we want to put perpetrators in prison. All of us agree on those three things. And I think this report shows that we are making progress. And it is, um, and, and as I said before, there's nothing in changing the commander out. Use common sense. How, how is a victim going to feel more protected when a commander has said this case is going forward or when a lawyer a half a continent away has said this case is going forward? Which is going to give her more protection or him more protection in the unit? Obviously, the commander signing off on the case going forward is going to give that survivor a lot more protection than a lawyer nobody knows a half a continent away. And that's what we'd be looking at if, in fact, the other alternative proposal had been adopted. Yes? The, Anybody the, else can answer these. I, they all know as much about it as I do. Right, you said it was a 25 percent reduction in the instances of sexual contact. contact. And, but that, that keeps in line with the 2010 numbers, so kind of brings you back to still a, still a high, high level there. And I'm curious your, your thoughts on that. Is it a matter of these, you know, these issues, is these new provisions taking some time to, you know, to make a difference? Um, or do you think more is needed beyond what's in the 15 bill? Well, I, I do think that, um, you know, by the way, um, it was down in FY10, but in 06, it was up um, at, a, at a higher rate than we've seen since then. So it was very high in 06. It dropped down in 10. It went back up in 12, and now it's back down in 14. Um, so obviously, the next survey is going to be important. So we can see if this, can, if this is going to be sustained. And I, I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but understand there's now two surveys. We didn't want them to quit doing the survey exactly as they'd been doing it because we wanted there to be a trend. On the other hand, this survey is very lacking in terms of specifics. The broad category of unwanted contact, I think my colleague, Senator Gillibrand, actually talked about this in one of the hearings. Um, it didn't distinguish between an unwanted slap on the behind and an actual rape. Now there's another survey that we began this year that they will now continue with a new baseline where we are getting much more information about the specifics of the crime. And I think that will be much more helpful for us to track the most egregious behaviors that, I mean, all of it's bad. Sexual harassment's bad. But obviously, brutal sexual assaults involving penetration um, are, are something that we've got to make sure we see a real downward trend. And frankly, the old survey didn't allow us to do that, and now the new one will. So there were actually two RAND surveys. And by the way, they had over 150,000 service people respond to these anonymous surveys, the highest number ever in any of the surveys they've ever done. It was um, a remarkable, it was over 30 percent of the active military responded to these surveys. So I think we've gotten everybody's attention.